feels incredible to admit this but. There was a time, not so long ago, when I doubted the very existence of Fergus Malloy. The late, great Fergus Malloy, a piss artist of genius, a Caravaggio in the art of getting drunk. To see Fergus bringing in a round was akin to watching Rembrandt shape up to his easel, Matisse prepare his palette. <laughs> First I thought it was some kind of practical joke, dreamt up to tease the newbie. I'd be sitting in the pub, the blue blazer say, or the beehive down in the grass market, one of the gang of four. Jake, who made sculptures out of stuff bought in pound shops, Annie, the abstract expressionist, and Ronald, a vegetarian Francis Bacon. It'd be shaping up to be a great night. Someone would have told an excellent story about some drunken exploit involving a pie supper and a mortuary assistant from leaving, and I'd be thinking, yes, this is what being a student's all about. Not sitting in some lecture hall, but in the pub, enjoying yourself. Then Jake would say, ah, but do you remember that time Fergus turned up carrying a heron? A real live heron he bumped into down in Stockbridge. And they'd all laugh at the memory, and then it would come. The moment I dreaded. The lull. Annie asking, did Fergus say he'd maybe pop in tonight? And they'd all look hopefully towards the pub door before Ronald would sigh and shake his head. Nah, said he'd be working. Got a new project. And that would be that. The night killed stone dead and all because this joker Fergus hadn't turned up. One night at the city calf, after another wake-like silence had descended, I'd had enough. Piped up with, OK, this is getting daft now. This whole Fergus shtick. You're having me on, right? What is he? Some kind of urban myth? You guys gone all conceptualist on me? Because you tell me that this guy, the guy who jumped onto one of the bulls of Paploma and rode it clean out of town who challenged Hunter S. Thompson to a beer can shooting contest and won, who once dared Bridget Bardot to eat his homemade sausage, actually exists. And it was as if I'd walked into a mosque wearing a bacon balaclava. A switch flicked, plunging the pub into silence, broken only by the occasional gasp, a whimper even, as if I'd said something really shocking like, you know, maybe Bojo isn't so bad after all, or actually, the wire was pretty dull, I thought the bill was much better. Inevitably, it was Fergus and his spectacular timing that proved the saving of me. Just as I was getting seriously spooked, feeling like the person who'd stuck Don't Worry Be Happy on their jukebox at the at a goth convention, the door of the calf burst open and in stottered one of the strangest looking men I'd ever seen. And bear in mind, I was at art college. Odd, but also weirdly familiar. I probably caught sight of him about time, but as he called out, Hello there! and ambled over to our booth, he kept reminding me of other things. A Giacometti statue freed from its plinth, an animated Picasso sketch of Don Quixote, an updated version of a Van Dyke portrait of Charles I having a swally. Battered black leather worky boots held together by laces and willpower alone, skinny long legs and jeans so tight I very much doubt there were any wee Ferguses running about, and his top half so bulky you wondered how those wiry legs kept the rest of him up. Wrapped in frayed layers of vests, shirts, jumpers, the occasional waistcoat, all topped off with a thick navy blue jacket that looked as if it had been previously belonged to a Russian naval commander, submarine commander, Fergus later corrected me. One in a darts game on a trawler crossing the Caspian Sea. The purple silk scarf wrapped round his neck, the pointy beard, wax moustache, thick thatch of salt and pepper hair, short at the back and sides, but hedge dragged, paint flecked on top, spiky and curly both, should have made him look ridiculous. A man to be escorted off the premises and into the nearest madhouse. 
but if anyone could pull off this boho dandy buck fast drinking Jakey pirate look, it was Fergus. By the time he'd made it to the booth, even though I hadn't even even been introduced yet, I was grinning, happy he was here, chuffed a bit, even proud that he was joining us. Because this was Fergus's talent, his uncanny knack, his glamour, if you like. By walking into a place he could make dull pub lights sparkle, music sound sweeter, laughter flow like cold pints of tenants on a hot day in August. So it was that night. Fergus took control in a way you didn't mind at all, scarcely noticed, like bobbing down a river on a raft and giving yourself over to the currents, a feeling exhilarating and scary at the same time. Yes, I admit my memory is somewhat hazy, but it was to discover this was par for the course after a night, a day, a week out with Fergus. Snatches of memory coming back to you in sober moments as confusing and exotic as dreams. Was that really Fergus playing accordion with a bunch of Croatian gypsies and whistle binkies? How would he find that club? The one in the vault under Southbridge, where you'd be dancing the red light turning everyone demonic, then look up and see a window. A skylight cut into the pavement above, folk passing by oblivious to the fun beneath their feet, or looking down, shaking their head in disbelief at the spectacle below. And where did those tequila sunrises come from? The tequila sunrises we slipped sitting on top of Carlton Hill while bats skimmed our heads, hedgehogs snuffled at our feet, the fir- the city turning rosy below us in the glow of the morning sun. It felt far too soon when Fergus stood and made an elaborate bow, telling us, Now folks, got to love you and leave you. There's a man I need to see about a stallion. And we knew he wasn't kidding. <laughs> I finally understood that lull, the slump when we gave up hope of Fergus's appearance. You'd have thought sometimes it would have come as a relief. The weekend essay was due, our exams were looming, it was probably best you didn't spend an evening wasted breaking into Edinburgh Zoo to feed chips to the penguins, getting a tour around Edinburgh Castle at 1am by an ex-marine night watchman, or, as Jake did one morning, wake up naked in the bed of a high court judge in the new town, clothes vanished, later located clothing various Edinburgh statues. But more often than not, Fergus's absence felt like an opportunity missed. Because when he did turn up to act as pished Pied Piper to our small band of wannabe retrobates, he made us feel... magnificent better than our sober selves. It was during one of those quieter evenings in the Blue Blazer that I asked him, Fergus, what do you, you know, do exactly? What is it, painting or sculpture or what? The art, I mean. And he gave me a look, a wouldn't you like to know smile, a twist of his moustache before waving his hand on the table and saying, this, this is what I do. This and other things. And there was Jake and Ronald talking intently, sketching out their plans for a future exhibition, an idea they'd been havering about until Fergus had got chatting to a gallery owner who'd agreed to give them some free space. And Annie was laughing so hard she could scarcely breathe at some joke told to her by the magician sitting next to her, a guy she'd never have met had Fergus not brought him over to pull pound coins out of her ears all evening. Piece artiste par excellence, c'est moi, Fergus said as he raised his glass. But there, just for a second, before the whisky touched his lips, I thought I caught a glimpse of something else. A quick flicker of sadness that was gone by the time, time he'd downed the drink and won gave me a wink and said, Now, if you'll excuse me, little boy's room. What shocked me most about Fergus's death was just how shocked I was. This was a man who'd lived life on the edge for years. He must have been close to 60, but acted as if he'd yet to leave his teens. Yet there was something timeless about him, thrown and indestructible. 
So when I walked into the city calf that afternoon to find Jake and Ronald and Annie with their drinks untouched, ashen face, eyes red rimmed, and I asked stupidly, Hey guys, what's up? Somebody died. And Ronald started to cry, Annie silently sliding a copy of the evening news over to me. I had to read the article three times before the terrible truth of it struck home. Artist killed in council death plunge, read the headline. He hadn't died, died while trying to scale the Scott Monument or abseiling down the Dean Bridge using a rope fashioned out of dressing gowns he'd found in a bag outside a charity shop, acts he'd threatened on previous nights out. Instead, according to the account provided by a visiting mariachi band, after a night in the tequila, he'd successfully fixed a sombrero to the head of the wooden figure that stands outside the council offices, I called out a triumphant, Ay caramba, before slipping and falling awkwardly onto his head. The sort of story that left you not knowing whether to laugh or cry, as the four of us sat there for the rest of the evening and did both. The church was packed out for the funeral, all Fergus's drinking buddies brought together in grief. You'd have thought it would have been a raucous event, a proper big send-off, but the wake was muted, everyone knowing the man who could have brought it to life was six feet under. We left early, promising to keep in touch with the policemen and drag queens, Poles and Lithuanians, tattooists and solicitors we'd met. But we knew without Fergus to bind us all together, it was unlikely we'd ever see each other again. A couple of days later, we were sitting in the Jolly Judge when the barman, Gordon, called us over. Here, Fergus wanted you for to have this, if anything happened. He handed over a brown envelope with something bulky wrapped up inside. I took it back over to the table and tipped out a set of three keys with a cardboard tag attached. In Fergus's curling script was written a flat number for Ramsey Gardens, the posh flats up by the Outlook Tower at the top of the Royal Mile, and a brief note. Want to find out about the art? Here's your chance. Enjoy, drink the place bone dry, and raise a glass or two or ten for me. After a brief discussion on how he could possibly have afforded to live there, we headed the short distance up the mile. The largest key opened the front door of one of the white painted blocks. Whispering and giggling like trespassers, we made our way up past the well-tended front doors of other flats, all pot plants and polished brass, until we reached the very top and stood in front of an unvarnished wooden door, covered in scratches and rough pencil sketches, burn marks and odd stains. Are we sure about this? Annie asked. I mean, you know what Fergus was like. Could be anything waiting for us, but it was too late. Ronald was turning the Yale, shoving his way in, and we followed behind and gasped. We were in what must have been an old attic space once, long and narrow, spanning the length of the building. It was filled with dark old furniture that Fergus had salvaged from skips. Bookcases fit to busting full of paperbacks, a huge red velvet couch, the walls covered with photos and pictures torn from magazines, a glorious drinks cabinet shaped like the prow of an ocean liner, full of fine wines and whiskies, vodka and gin, and multicoloured liqueurs with languages on the labels none of us recognised. But what took our breath away was the view, that and the light, the wonderful buttery light. The windows filled one wall entirely, four of them, letting in as much of the sight of Edinburgh bathed in late August sunlight as possible. The two central panes were clear, but the other two appeared to be decorated with some sort of stained glass effect. They were covered in bands of colour, light primrose yellow at the top, shading down through to a daffodil yellow, ripe satsuma orange, burnt tobacco brown, dark port reds at the bottom. Drawn to them instinctively, we split into pairs to discover the narrow shelves of perspex set against the frames holding hundreds and hundreds of tiny plastic bottles. Plastic bottles with lined labels stuck on the side of them, and it was Annie who cried out, The filthy, stinking bastard! All of us leaping back in horror, laughing in disgust and disbelief at what we'd found. After 
My Ronald opened the tiny fridge in the tiny galley kitchen, handed out cans of tenants, our hysteria dying down after a few swigs. Jake, wrapping his hand in some toilet paper and ignoring our ewes, eased out one of the urine sample bottles and read out the label. February the 14th, 1996. The Elephant Tabor, Night in a Lighthouse, The Twins from Berlin. Another one. July 8th, 2001, Shetland, The Poet Chasing Seals, Casting Pottery Limpets, The Sun Never Sets, But The Northern Lights Blazing. We overcame our squeamishness after that, taking turns to read out Fergus's great artwork, the one he devoted his life to, the one he died for, a memorial to every night out. September the 1st, 2006. Festival fireworks, champagne with a Viscount, waking up in Queen Street Gardens, covered in dew. Then we sat on the red velvet sofa, facing out to the view, filled our glasses with a fine single malt, and we toasted the late, great Fergus Malloy again and again as the evening sun sank, turning us golden, and on until fireworks filled the sky. Thank you.